Nobel Prize award-winning author Muhammad Yunus talks about his efforts to expand social business around the world. Mr. Yunus argues that the profit-making power of capitalism can be harnessed to fulfill social needs and build economies. The Ronald Reagan Building in Washington, D.C. hosts this hour-long talk. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm so honored and delighted to be here this morning. Particularly, I didn't realize that uh, I'm competing with Sarah Palin. <laughs> and I would like to give a big applause to all the daring people who organized this, all the names and all the organizations who are behind it. Thank you. And this is very important for me because this is the first event on the, the book launching, the book that is coming up. Uh, and I'm not sure how, uh, what kind of response I'll get from the book. But each time I had a book, I get a tremendous amount of response from people, very warm response, which led me to do the next one. And that's, uh, again, the last one that I had, the Creating a World Without Poverty, Social Business and Future of Capitalism that created so much of a, uh, a response from all around the world, particularly from the young people. And they had so many questions asked as the right to me. And I've been answering these questions in many forums, in many interviews, in many speeches. And people keep saying that, but uh, you are doing it in a piecemeal manner. Why don't you put them all together? So then that idea came that why don't you put them together? So this is what I have done, is to put them together. I'm sure it will raise many more questions, and it will be fun to answer those questions, too. Uh, many of you are familiar and uh, almost uh, uh, personally involved in microfinance, so I don't have to talk about microfinance, but uh, that is not my intention. But while we did the microfinance, many do not realize how many other things we did side by side. And that's a missing part of our work, and which I tried to bring out in my last book. One thing I did right from the beginning of microfinance that we did in, in the village of Bangladesh, uh, we created something uh, assembling all the ideas of the borrowers and their struggles uh, encapsulated in something called 16 decisions. Uh, they make their own decisions about their life. And um, one of those decisions are, uh, one of those is uh, we shall send our children to school uh, and make sure uh, they continue in the school. And we took each one of those decisions to follow up to see how to achieve those goals that they have set for themselves. So these are 16 goals actually for their life. And out of them, we created companies, so I look back and I see, whenever I see a problem, I try to address the problem uh, by creating a company. Uh, so in the process, we created many, many such companies. Uh, some became formal companies, some remain halfway done companies, never developed into a formal company. Uh, one of such thing was, uh, at the beginning, I was facing the problem of uh, night blindness among the children of uh, Grameen borrowers uh, in extreme poverty. Uh, you see a lot of things, uh, but I had no idea this thing is a common phenomenon in the villages of Bangladesh. Children cannot see after sunset. When the night comes, they become blind. Uh, and I couldn't believe that uh, such a thing happened, such a thing can happen to these young kids. So I, I started talking about it to the doctors and so on, and uh, I got the advice that this is uh, curable. This is because of the vitamin A deficiency. So if you can arrange vitamin A, uh, this will cure itself. So they gave us uh, lots of options how to bring vitamin A. One very popular option everybody was recommending is to bring uh, vitamin A tablets. So give these tablets to the children, and gradually they will overcome this problem. And the other one, uh, which they didn't emphasize much, uh, if they can eat vegetables because vegetables carries the natural vitamin A. After a lot of discussion inside uh, with my colleagues, I decided to do it the other way, with vegetables. Uh, and then we started selling seeds. 
because I thought if you, people have seeds easily available and good quality seeds, which are not, normally is not available, uh, people will gradually love it and will encourage them to grow vegetables. And that became a part of the 16 decisions. One of the decisions says, we shall grow vegetable all year round and eat plenty of it and sell the surplus. Because people always kind of connected something growing to sell. We kind of reverse that kind of idea that we eat plenty of it, meaning that our children will be eating plenty of it, and sell the surplus. And unless we can finish all, because we have plenty of it, then we sell. It became a very popular program. Everybody wanted to buy the seeds, because we put them in one penny packet. No matter how expensive the seed is, each packet is one penny. And in the beginning, they were not sure what they were supposed to do. So we explained a little bit. And Bangladesh soil is very fertile soil. All you do is just sprinkle the seeds. The seeds kind of uh, jump back, <laughs> grow beautiful vegetables. And when you see this fresh vegetable, you feel like eating. Normally, people don't eat vegetables. That's very strange. You can grow it. It's very easy. But uh, people stick to rice. Rice is their main thing, and everybody wants to have lots of rice. Uh, even if it is with salt, they will eat the rice, uh, which creates a lot of other problems. So this is the first time they get familiar with uh, vegetables. In the process, night blindness over time disappeared from Bangladesh. So this was, our, again, we did it in a very commercial way. We didn't want to lose money on that project, that we want to cover all the cost of operations and making those seeds, packets, and so on. Everything has to be covered. So this is my first kind of reaction to a problem that I saw. And then we started encouraging the children to go to school as a part of 16 decisions. And we achieved that goal, having all the children in school. And then we see gradually, year after year, they're coming to the higher education. When they came to the higher education level, they were very qualified, able to do that, but the financing was not available because parents cannot support up to that level. So we immediately introduced education loan. Again, my reaction to address this issue in a commercial way, uh, but commercial in a quote-unquote commercial way because that's the whole issue that I'm raising here. Because with the moment we say commercial, it looks like somebody's making money out of it. Uh, that's not what we did. In a business way, uh, we did that. And as a result, now thousands and thousands of students are in higher education, in medical schools, engineering schools, universities, and many have done their PhDs. Uh, many are working in universities and practicing medicines in all over Bangladesh. And each year, batches and batches are coming out as a highly educated people. While their parents are still illiterate uh, the way they were, they will never had this opportunity. Uh, so each time I see a problem, I create this kind of thing, and I became fascinated with the uh, information technology in the 80s. This was something coming up, and I thought, my God, this is the way. This is the way to get the people out of poverty, uh, because if people have the control over the technology, they will change their life, because they have the creativity, they have the energy, uh, simply connecting them with the rest of the world. So what I did, I got the opportunity, I applied for a license to create a mobile phone company and explained to the government agency that we'll create this telephone company to bring telephone in the villages, because in the villages, telephone didn't exist. At that time, there was hardly half a million telephone in the whole world. Uh, so we thought this would be a good opportunity to bring that uh, telephone and bring it to the villages, and we insisted that we'll give loans to the women in Grameen Bank, the Grameen Bank is all women, will give loans to the women to buy cell phones and sell the service of the cell phones. So government agency got very irritated by that. How can you do that? Uh, how can you give cell phone to the illiterate woman? What is she going to do with that? Who is she going to call? <laughs> Uh, and so it created a lot of uh, tension. I, I tried to explain to them. They wouldn't listen to that. But after all those debates and so on, finally we got the license. And we created a company called Grameen Phone and started doing exactly what we wanted to do, bring the telephone services in the villages and give the phone in the hands of the poor women to sell the service. The question the agency was raising that uh, even if she wants to sell, who's going to buy? I said, 
anybody will need to make a phone call, will have to come to her because she is only, she's the only one in the village who has a phone. Uh, so there's no other way. They didn't believe that a woman can do that. She has not seen a telephone in her life, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I'll take a chance. It became a roaring business. And the telephone ladies, we call them telephone ladies, they became very successful in selling the service and it became an instant source of money and very quick way to get out of poverty. In the process, telephones started coming to the village because at that time, globally, people never thought that telephones would be needed in the villages. So always thought about it, something commercial, something business world will be using it, business executives will be using it. So I kind of reversed the whole idea. We said, no, it's the poorest women will be using this and make money out of that. Uh, so I had uh, several ideas that the one, if you can make money out of this and you uh, uh, control a new technology, for the first time you are having introduced to an absolutely state-of-the-art technology of the world, which is just emerging. And it will change her life, it will change the life of the village. Today, after, now this is 2000, we launched the program in 1997, uh, this is hardly 13 years now. We have over 55 million subscribers of telephones in the whole country. With the, country, with the population of 150 million, you can imagine every third, three person, every third person has a telephone. You go anywhere, whether it's a kid, whether it's a woman, whether it's a man, whether it's a rickshaw puller, whether it's a uh, boatman, everybody has a phone. So it's, and our telephone coverage in Bangladesh, I can tell you very frankly, is better than the United States. <laughs> <laughs> because everything is covered. There's no single spot where you say you don't have telephone coverage. Uh, so, and this telephone now uh, also carries the internet uh, connectivity and so on. So we created company after company like that. And it became, in the process, Grameen Phone became the largest company in the country. It's not just largest telephone company, it's the largest company in the country. Uh, so we created the energy company, Grameen Shakti or Grameen Energy, to bring solar energy in the country. And today we have 350,000 solar home system working in Bangladesh. Each month we are adding another 16 to 17,000 solar home system. So it's expanding very well. Uh, again, very uh, business-like way. We don't uh, depend on any subsidy or anything. Usually renewable energy is connected with subsidies and all the government efforts to do that. We have nothing. We just go on and people like it because they have electricity out of this. And we introduced the uh, biogas, uh, biogas plants. Now it's working and uh, we are trying to improve that. The plant is made uh, of brick and mortar. So recently we are switching to uh, fiberglass. It works much better because instantly you can do that and start the plant right away. And then we have introduced the uh, improved uh, stove, cooking stove, uh, which consumes less, less of fuel and so on. Uh, I think within uh, next year or uh, by 2013 definitely will have more than a million uh, cooking stove in Bangladesh functioning. Uh, so again, they are responding very well, and it's also based on uh, uh, business-like way, it's covering cost. So in the process, I created uh, just about 40 companies. And people ask me, why do you, you must be a very rich man. You have all these big companies running for you, it's made a lot of money. So they say, oh, you are so, it's taking up all this money. I said, no, I don't have any money. I'm just the same way I was. Uh, how come you don't have money? I said, I don't own any of these companies. So that became a big issue. Why do you create company if you don't own it? And then I started asking myself, why did I do that if I don't own it? <laughs> <laughs> because I was so uh, focused on solving the problem, I didn't think about owning or something. So I said, maybe this is one piece which is missing in the whole structure of economic. Because then I started looking at what the theoretical structure of economics is uh, in a capitalist system. In, the, in that capitalist system, you have only one kind of business. The moment you say business, you mean you're making money. Otherwise, it has no meaning if you're not making money. So that's why when I use the word commercial, I try to quickly put the quote unquote, I said this is commercial meaning something else.